All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to, day, to today's Scrum at Scale webinar presentation. I'm Alyssa from Scrum at Scale LLC, and I would like to welcome you all. Thank you for joining us. Today, I have Brian Levy and Rhonda Coombs. And before handing it off to Brian and Rhonda, I'd like to take a moment just to cover a few housekeeping items. First, to provide you all with the best listening experience, all audio lines except for the host and the presenters will be muted. We will not be utilizing the raise hand functionality later in the webinar. However, if at any time you'd like to ask a question or add a comment to the conversation, please use the Q&A panel on your console. And finally, if you have any difficulties with Zoom throughout the presentation, feel free to send me, the Scrum at Scale admin, a question in the chat. All right, and with that, and as we see people come on in, I'd like to hand it over to Brian and Rhonda. Take it away, you guys. All right, thank you. Uh, and welcome to all of you here who are joining us for our portfolio management with Scrum at Scale. Um, and you should have, we're gonna give you a poll question to start off with. And so hopefully um, everyone has that poll question. Um, you can answer that. There we go. We'll give you a, a few minutes to go ahead and, uh, and answer that question. And as you're answering, just to uh, kind of introduce ourselves as the, the host speakers, um, I'm Brian Levy. I'm a, a Scrum at Scale trainer and also president of Bridgeport Digital. So I've been working in, in this whole area of uh, portfolio management and strategic planning for um, probably about 18 years or so. Um, also uh, working with Agile for about 18 to 20 years also. And Rhonda, I don't, I don't know if you want to give a quick intro of yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Rhonda Coombs, and um, I've been working closely with Brian most recently, but I have about uh, 15 years experience in this area, leading PMOs, operations, and helping organizations to focus on their strategy. And so, um, so uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some of those experiences with you in this webinar. Terrific. And then I'll do next is that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ping Alyssa to, to see uh, that, that we were able to get the poll results. How are we doing with those so far? I was, yes. I The first one has been launched, but I can end it now. It looks like the numbers are coming to a bit of a standstill. There we go. Oh, okay. And what I'll do is uh, just to give people a, a, a few more seconds, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and talk about our, our, why we're actually making this change, like why we're introducing something new for Agile Portfolio Management. And just to kind of set the stage um, as we get those poll numbers in here, what I want to talk about here is I read this interesting article, and it was a, probably a decade ago uh, from the Harvard Business Review. And the name of the article was called The Execution Draft. And in the article, which I thought was brilliant, it made such a lasting impression on me. What it talked about was different CEOs and how they talked about how they created these great strategies. And I'm gonna read some of the quotes from this article, as you can see on your screen. The first quote is, the trouble is Simon and Bosley, so talking about, you know, Simon from, a, from Citigroup, um, Bossity from Allied Signal, their doctrine that execution is the key to a strategy success is as flawed as it is popular. He goes on further to say, unfortunately, that is exactly what often happens when people are trying to understand why their strategy is failing, especially when consulting firms are involved. And kind of what he's, talk what he's talking about here is that the predominant um, theory for strategy was that you could actually have a brilliant strategy, but CEOs would actually say, you know what, my strategy was great, it was brilliant, but the execution just didn't happen the way it was supposed to. And the truth of the matter is that when you're actually executing a good strategy, the only way you really know if it's a great strategy is by the results. If the outcome is good, 
then you know that the strategy was good because you should be incorporating the resources you have available, the people you have available, all that should be considered with your strategy, with your approach. But if the strategy is bad, you'll know it because the outcome will be bad. And so when we come to this, this whole area of portfolio management and thinking about how do we connect the strategy for an organization to actually the actual execution, what we have to keep in mind is that you should judge everything by the outcome that it produces. And to that end, as we move forward today, our agenda is the first to find portfolio management. We'll talk about um, what it means to have a strategic outcome. We'll, we'll discuss outcome versus output. We'll talk about the method of assessing outcome by time boxes. Um, we'll talk about the cadence we should do for that assessment. And then finally, we'll provide some links between the outcome and strategy. So that's what we actually want to go through today. But let me start out um, just by discussing our first item, which is what is portfolio management? And so when we talk about portfolio management, we're discussing, and here we're going to have poll question number two, Alyssa, <laughs> you can put that out. What we're discussing when we discuss portfolio management are all the processes and the tools that actually align your strategy to your execution. And with that, with that, there's a couple things you should know. The first bullet here is that portfolio management, what it actually does is it translates your strategy and objective that you want to accomplish in the future into a list of valuable elements to achieve these objectives. So that's the main point of it. With that, not only does it actually do that translation, but it also works with about controlling the elements in your portfolio and controlling their outcome. So again, I don't know if I actually have the right approach for my strategy unless I judge it by the outcome. So portfolio management should be heavily focused on trying to figure out how to control the outcome by itself for each one of the elements and as a group within the portfolio. Additionally, portfolio management should it involve assessing the planning that you're doing to make sure that everything is aligned with the strategy and the objective. But you're going to, you have that approach that you're going to take to execute your strategy. Portfolio management should involve really looking to see does that approach actually, are we planning in a way that will reach our strategy and our objective? And then finally, we want to verify that with the outcomes that were produced, the benefits that actually came out of it, we want to verify that we got the value out of it. Because if we're not getting the value that we actually think that we should receive, we should probably change our strategy. So, Rhonda, what are your thoughts on this? So what you're describing, Brian, is everything's done starting at the top, starting from looking at that strategy and decomposing from there and everything aligns and everything must align. And if it doesn't, you got to ask yourself why you're doing it. But what I see uh, often is that people group a set of projects together and call it a portfolio. But that's a very bottoms up approach. And that is basically a grouping of a set of outputs. But we're saying you got to focus on the outcomes you want, especially at the strategic level is where you need to start. And then all of the elements in your portfolio derive from that. So that bottoms up approach just doesn't work. So one thing that, that we, we really want to key on with the whole theme about portfolio management and looking at the outcomes is that traditionally, when we think about portfolio management, we're focused on the items that need to get produced. And what we're saying is that your strategy should change 
we need to focus on the outcomes that are produced. And to that end, again, if you want to actually achieve your strategy, right? And again, I'm, I'm displaying kind of a, the decomposition, the components of your strategy, right? I have a mission. Here's where I am right now. I have a vision of where I want to be in the future. And the gap between those is your strategy, right? You're going to have strategic goals, um, some objectives that are broken down a little bit more. You're going to have strategic assumptions that underlie these. Because when you developed your strategy, you didn't have perfect information. There were things that you didn't know. You're acting on them as if they're true, but you really don't know that they are true. And then you're going to have these organizational values. And what we want to do when we actually do our portfolio management is because we know we have these strategic assumptions, we need to verify these assumptions are true. If you don't verify these things first and the assumptions aren't true, then everything that you build or you plan on building related to it is going to be incorrect. And so you'll actually do a lot of work that's unnecessary. This is the key. You know, again, we talk about achieving these outcomes. Typically what happens um, when you're actually going through and doing, especially in agile transformation, is a lot of people are focused on how do I get the outcomes that agile promises? And the reason we aren't getting the outcomes is because we're not actually focused on the outcome, right? So there was a, a, an opening question here, and I want to kind of read and go through it. Uh, the question was, does this strategy apply to external projects with multiple clients who all have different views of what Agile is? And the answer to this question is yes. Your strategy is to be about your organization. And so it's therefore going to apply to everything your organization does, including how it actually interacts with different clients if you're in a service type organization. And again, what you really want is to be able to go ahead, not only to address your you know, address the strategy, but know in advance that your strategy is being successful. Great question. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rhonda to talk about our next item, the strategic outcome definition. Thanks, Brian. So strategic outcomes. So let's talk about that for a minute. So as Brian was just showing you, you have your company's mission and you have your company's vision and your strategy should be how do you get from where you are today, your mission, to your vision? What's that gap and how do you close the gap? That's your strategy. So the outcome, the strategic outcome, is what are the gains that you're getting? What are the long-term changes and gains that you get as you increment your strategy? So if you were to, to look at that vision and paint a picture of it, what does that look like? What would you see? What would you be able to, uh, what changes would you, would you be able to define? What does success look like? Those are your outcomes from a strategy point of view. So Brian's bringing up my picture for me. So if you start there and we say we need our strategic outcomes and you start at the top, you come up with your strategic outcomes. What does success look like? Um, is it, you know, is it achieving more market share? Is it achieving better, uh, you know, that customers love you? Whatever those strategic outcomes are that you paint to get to that vision, that's where you start. And then in our methodology, we take those high level outcomes and we decompose the outcomes. So if you look at the, at the, chart here at the slide, we have our strategic goal outcomes. That strategic goal outcome gets decomposed into a set of smaller outcomes. Those become our strategic objective outcomes. And so we, uh, so we actually decompose the higher level outcomes into smaller level outcomes. And if I add all the lower level outcomes up, 
they should get me that higher level outcome to know that you've, you, you've done a complete job on the decomposition. If, you, if those lower level outcomes don't add up to the higher level outcome, you need to go back and get it complete because in the end, you want to achieve that full outcome that's desired. We continue breaking down that structure where you take then that strategic objective outcome, decompose it into our initiative outcome. That's the, the, the decomposition we use, the terminology we use. And so you actually see what we build here is a complete breakdown of outcomes. We don't focus on a breakdown structure of work. We focus on a breakdown structure of outcomes. And that might be a very different approach from what you're used to. But the reason is, if you're looking at strategic outcomes, if you're looking at, um, at moving, um, being effective, you want to focus on those. Now, you'll also notice that one other thing to point out here is underneath outcome is actually your output. So I have my strategic goal outcomes and my output is I achieve my strategic goal. Then I have my strategic objective outcome, which is the decomposition of the higher level and aligned to that is the output that I want that I'm going to go do the strategic objective. So you don't have the breakdown of the work. Again, you have a breakdown structure based on outcomes. So it's a, it's a, it's a flip and it, and it might feel confusing at first, but I tell you, once you can get your head around this, it, it is an incredibly powerful in helping the organization execute in achieving their strategy. Brian, any thoughts on that? Yeah, one thing I just want to add in is that keep in mind, if you want to achieve a certain outcome, and again, we had that first poll question about are you receiving the benefits of your agile transformation? And a lot of people said, hey, we're not receiving those benefits, right? If, you're, if you want to actually receive the benefits and reach your strategic outcome, you have to focus people's attention on the outcome. And keep in mind, what Agile was designed to do is to have you make your expectations transparent, inspect so you assess whether or not you're reaching the outcome, and then you adapt. So I change what I'm producing, I change the actual strategic goal or the feature or the initiative in order to adapt it to meet my outcome, right? It, you have to have the focus on the outcome itself in order to know when you should adapt. Mm -hmm. Now, one more thing in the slide, you'll notice that we have roles um, on top of different parts of this, the breakdown structure. And so if you think of Scrum at Scale, Scrum at Scale has that product owner loop. And that product owner loop is really responsible for making sure the right outcomes are being produced at the, the, the level of the structure that is owned by that role. So if you look at the EMS and you have formed an EMS, they're really, they're really responsible for the strategic outcomes. Um, chief product owner, maybe they're responsible for the outcomes at the initiative level and the feature level, and then the product owner is responsible for the outcomes at the team level. Um, but you need to have a clear set of ownership of who's responsible for outcomes at the different levels of your structure. And Scrum at Scale supports that so nicely. It ties in really nicely, um, makes it very clear, and holding these people who are playing these roles responsible for achieving those outcomes. The one other thing to note is just kind of a good rule of thumb is that every, every role can be responsible for typically one to two layers. We found that more than two layers is too much because managing this and managing to achieve the right outcomes is a lot of work. And so we find that typically one layer is doable, two layers sometimes doable. Beyond that, it gets really really complicated for one role to own more than one outcome level. Next slide, Brian. Did we get any questions that came in on that or are we good? No questions? 
Okay, so let's move on to outcomes versus outputs. So we want to talk about that. So the the, the customers that we're speaking to, clients we're speaking to, organizations, what we're finding is that many clients, many customers are in their agile transformation. And sometimes they've been in their second agile transformation or maybe even their second or third year of their agile transformation. And we're hearing a lot of frustration because there's been a lot of money put into these. There's been a lot of resources put into these and it's still not producing what they want. And so we've been doing some investigation to try and figure out why. And so what we've come up with is, um, is a lack of focus on outcomes, which is a lack of focus on being effective. Instead, what we find is that agile transformations are often focused on being efficient and not being effective. So let me give you an example. So you see the picture there of the person working out. So give you the analogy. So you want to lose weight and you've decided I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go make this happen. I've got this goal and you go start working out. You're working out hard. You're doing your sit-ups. And even with all the exercise you do, you're not getting the results you want. Why? Because it's actually proven that losing weight is more tied to what you eat and less tied to just exercising. You can't just exercise to lose weight. Typically, you need to go on a diet and control what you eat. And so the same way with organizations, instead of actually just doing the exercise of efficiency, where maybe where, where some of those practices might be helping the team with their ceremonies, um, making the team, you know, this, this, mighty, this mighty force that can execute and deliver everything seamlessly. That's efficiency, but effectiveness, you've got to go back to your outcomes and say, are we focused on getting the outcomes instead of just a, you know, a checklist of deliverables that were very efficient at delivering? The problem is you can have super efficient teams, amazing scrum teams who are great at delivering, but if you're delivering the wrong thing, you may never be successful. So first you've got to focus on delivering the right thing to be effective, and then you can focus on the efficiency part. So again, going back to workout, you've got to focus on what you're eating and stop eating so much or stop eating the wrong things. And then later you can focus on efficiency in the exercise part. So the quote at the bottom of the slide there, the slide there is organizations that simply focus on output metrics, meaning they're focused on outputs only, are not seeing the big picture, which is they need to ensure that they're delivering value, the outcomes to their customers and their business. Um, I've seen tons of transformations where I ask, where are your success metrics? And the success metrics I see are all about efficiency and not about effectiveness. So we want to switch that. We want to get people focused on the outcomes and being effective. Next slide, Brian. And there's a poll question, if Alyssa could help us get that poll going while we get ready for the next slide. Our third question. So what's the difference between outputs and outcomes? So here's um, bringing in Scrum at Scale again and looking at where do you get efficiency in Scrum at Scale? Where do you get effectiveness? And efficiency is really driven by the teams, making sure they understand how to do their ceremonies, how to do their retrospectives, how to get them executing as best as possible, making sure they're fully staffed teams, cross-functional, whereas effectiveness is really focused on that product owner loop, that product owner cycle, where you take the strategy, you decompose it into the outcomes you need, and then the work to support those outcomes. 
that effectiveness has to be there. And so we put that product owner loop, we make them responsible for coming up with a strategy to get the right outcomes. So how do you do that? So let's look at the slide here. Um, and so you have an outcome. How do, you, how do you get that outcome? What do you do with that? You've defined your outcome. You take a look and you say, what would I see if, if I saw success? I would see this outcome. So what do you do with that? How do you go execute on an outcome? So an outcome, you're gonna have to go make some assumptions and hypotheses. You're basically going to have to come up with an approach. And if you remember the scientific method that you probably learned in school around junior high, that's exactly what this is, is, is you come up with some assumptions because you're dealing with incomplete information. You, you, you do research, but you never have proof yet. You always, almost always have incomplete information. So you make some assumptions. And based on those assumptions, you're going to go and come up with a hypothesis that says, if my hypotheses were true, then I'm going to take these actions, a set of outputs, which I am going to assume if I do these outputs, it will give me the outcome desired. And so you're going to act on that hypothesis as if it were true, deliver outputs, ensure that it moves the needle on the outcomes that you desire and get that feedback loop to tell you if you're on the right track or not. And you're basically going to prove out your assumptions and hypothesis. You're gonna use empirical data to show you if you were right or not, or if you need to change. And this is going to force you sometimes to think differently, because a lot of times we come up with these assumptions and hypotheses, and we assume that they're true. We actually believe they're true, and sometimes we don't realize that they're not, but we're going to use the data to tell us if it's true or not and prove it out to us, and it might challenge your thinking. It might challenge what you thought was true, and it proves out to, to, to say that, no, actually it's not, and you've got to change your approach, and you've got to change your hypothesis, which means then if if it proves to be false, you have to change the output that you're going to ask the organization to deliver. You're going to change the work that you're asking them to do because your hypothesis needs to change. So one thing I'd like to stress during this time is that the way we currently operate most of the time is that we focus on a set of outputs and delivery, and the underlying assumption is that these are the right outputs to produce. These are the right things for us to do. These are the right services and products to give to our customers. And just by doing it, you'll produce the, the outcome that's desired. And so because we're focused on that so much, it becomes almost a race to try to actually build whatever we need to build as fast as possible. But again, if your underlying assumptions are incorrect, then this may not be true. Maybe those are not the right outputs, and maybe you should inspect it and adapt and do something different. And so what you want to do is make sure that you set targets so that you are collecting data about how much you're progressing towards your output so you can actually change in advance. And I see that the... Uh, the poll results have come back, and you know most of us have actually uh, we, we have the, the right idea about outputs and outcomes, such that we know that outcomes describe the benefits that you're going to receive to your your customers and your organization, and that you're actually going to be responsible for making sure that you try to extract those benefits as well as you possibly can. So. And, uh, we, we had a couple questions that popped up. We want to uh, start addressing some of these questions that popped up. The, the second question here is, is it best to achieve the strategy for service delivery 
about outlining these roles in the SOW or charter? And the answer to that question is a resounding absolutely yes. You want to make sure that the roles for everyone is, is actually clearly delineated. But here's the key. When Rhonda went over discussing kind of the hierarchy of outcomes, when you discuss the role, you need to break things down and make sure that you make part of the role accountable for producing the outcome. Traditionally, what we've done incorrectly in the past is that we make people responsible for doing activities, and then we make them responsible for producing outputs. But if you want an actual outcome, you need to make everyone accountable for their delivery of that outcome. And if they need to change their activities or change their out what they produce in order to get that outcome, then they should do it. That's like the basis of being agile. All right, so the next question we have here is, if this outcome, and I'm not sure what WOW, what WOW stands for, um, is so tough to manage, what levels do you expect that the different layers are described? And this is an excellent question. What you really want is for um, all levels to be responsible for outcome you're going to break down the outcome the way Rhonda had in the previous slide. And let me go back up so you can actually see it. You want to break up the actual outcome into different pieces. And that way, people at different levels can actually be partitioned or, or be given the outcome that they're responsible for so that your whole organization is focused on outcome. I'm going to keep going back to this theme that if people are not focused on the outcomes that they're expected to deliver, then your, your guarantee or your risk of not being able to uh, achieve it is just going to increase, right? You have to focus people on what you really want, which is the outcome, not the output. Right. And, and to add to that, Brian, we have the roles here that we use as the people, the role responsible for the outcomes in the hierarchy, in the outcome structure. And what we find is usually people have to be taught this. It's not a skill that most people have, have used before or have been taught before, and it often doesn't come naturally to people. And so that's one of the things we have found we have to do is actually go and teach those that are in that product owner loop this skill set. It's super Absolutely. important that they understand it and they have it. Absolutely. And so, it's, it's, Brian, one more thing I'm gonna, yep. oh, it, we have another question here uh, that I want to make sure we touched on because someone asked um, if we had any examples to elaborate and how like one or two layers where every role can perform uh, what they're supposed to perform at. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the, a client that you and I have worked with together in which um, we divided up the organization. So they had, um, they had team, they had managers, and then we had relationship, um, relationship managers. And we made the the actual team, we made them responsible for feature outcomes. So we, we actually went to the, uh, the the users and asked them what they wanted, what outcomes they wanted, and they would give us, well, here are these features. And so we'd ask them, well, what do you want to produce? Why do you want this feature? Like, what are you expecting to get out of it? And that information went to the actual product owners, and they were responsible for working with people um, with the users and the business organization to make sure that they actually produce those outcomes. And then, again, they would talk to the team, and as part of the sprint review, they would get feedback about, hey, you deployed this, we're using it this way, but it didn't give us this outcome we expected. And then we collaborated as a team with sprint review to figure out, well, what can we adjust to get us that outcome? So it became a regular part of the cycle. 
um, the relationship manager, they kind of correspond to our chief product owner here. Um, they, they were, they received a feature outcome, but also an initiative for an entire, entire year. And they were responsible for making sure that those benefits were actually achieved. And so like one of the, uh, you know, specific examples that we actually have for a year, we did this project where we were changing out the whole data infrastructure platform. Um, and with that platform, they were supposed to be able to pull up certain reports at different parts um, from different parts of the business. And instituting that platform, we had to make sure that everybody in the organization was able to access the data and pull the reports they needed. Um, so hopefully that, that gives you a, a good example. Again, that whole infrastructure was the initiative outcome that everyone should be able to pull up um, the data that they had that they needed within within the year. Um, and then there was the feature. There were specific data pieces that people wanted, and so those were actually brought in. So hopefully that's a, a good uh, explanation there. We got a couple more questions. I'm going to tackle these, uh, Rhonda. <laughs> sure, keep so, going. All right, what's your opinion about OKRs? They're so popular uh, due to so-called Spotify model, um, copy-paste transformation. In my experience, they end up as new name for KPI focused on output. And unfortunately, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> they, I like the concept of OKRs, um, but again, the, the with, uh, so Rhonda happens to be um, pretty good at OKRs. <laughs> I shouldn't say pretty good; she's excellent at it. And I, I'll put you on the spot, Rhonda. What what what's the O and OKR stand for? The objective. And so here's the deal: the 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 objective that we should have, they should be more outcome focus and if we actually did that for our, our okr then the methodology would work but it, this is a paradigm shift we're used to producing widgets everything in your business is widget based at most levels and so we we our focus instead of the objective what you're trying to achieve a goal what you end up writing in the okr ends up being output things that are produced and that's a benefit to the organization. If you made that switch, everything will be fine. But again, it, we have to make that mental switch in order to get things going. Right. Yeah. So again, if you look at our structure, the structure is broken down based on outcomes. A strategic objective in our structure is an output. But there's an, another question here. How do you quantify outcome for different business functions? Um, well, there's two things you should know about this. The first thing is that when you're actually looking at achieving strategic outcomes for the organization, you should look at the whole organization, right? What tends to happen in businesses and even in some particular agile methods, we actually partition out budget to different departments, different business functions, and not looking at the whole. And when you do that, you end up creating silos. So again, what you want to do is actually look at the whole thing. Because what should happen is if I'm in one department and Rhonda's in a different department and we each have our budget, but we figure out, you know what? Overall, we're trying to expand sales in Asia. And Rhonda has a method that is actually producing more sales in Asia. If that's the highest priority for the company, I should give up part of my budget to Rhonda and actually help her reach the company objective because then we all win. And so if you want to, again, you want to split this up to actually focus on that overall objective. There's one thing I'm going to, I'm going to point out is I read this, this book, one of my favorite books, is How to Measure Anything by Douglas Hubbard. And what he talks about in this book is that how people have trouble sometimes creating metrics and, and actually measuring things. And 
his whole premise of the book is that the only time that you have trouble measuring things is when you haven't defined it enough. And if you go back and actually define what it is and what are the observable characteristics to let you know that you've achieved it, well, then quantifying it becomes easy because I have these characteristics. I can count. I can, I can measure how much of those characteristics we actually have. The problem is that we don't define things enough. And the same thing goes with outcomes. Because we're not outcome focused and we're output focused, what we do is we like to count what we produce, the widgets. But what we really care about is the benefit. Now, I, I want, I'm expanding out to China and in Asia, but the reason I'm doing it is because I want higher sales. It's, that's the outcome I want, is a higher sale, right? And I think that the notoriety that I get from actually going to that region will actually produce a higher sale. And so there, in that last slide, there was another uh, question, and we'll have to put that question to everyone to answer it, but this goes and speaks towards the hypothesis that you're creating in the test, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, for example, product function already knows the customer impact that he wants to measure, for, but engineering director is more focused on delivery. Yeah, again, your whole question, this whole example goes toward, we need to work as a, a team and an organization. Um, one of the things that Rhonda and I do as part of our practice that's been really successful is we've gone in and changed the way that, one, the initiatives are created for the organization, but then, two, how people are rewarded. You know, so one of our biggest partners with this is HR. When we go in here early, they make sure that we don't reward people for only maximizing their silo and not maximizing the entire company. All right, this next question here, how are outcomes elaborated um, in, in Scrum with Scrum um, throughout the organization to ensure outcomes relate back to the EMS? Um, how do you stay on track? Does your whole organization have to buy in? And this is an excellent question. The, again, I'm gonna go back to the slide here where we have the breakdown of the outcomes. And notice, you know, we have a hierarchy, but everything relates to an outcome. As long as you're breaking down things by outcome, level by level, and making sure that those outcomes are actually visible to everybody, then you can do a really good job of keeping track of everything. And so, again, you want to have that outcome focus and make sure everyone has visibility to that. Now, how do I relate it back? The outcomes and part of your, your meta scrum, because remember, your, your meta scrums are on the product owner loop, and that's where we're actually looking at what needs to get produced. Part of your, the gathering in the meta scrum should be looking, defi well, defining the metrics that let me know whether or not I reach the outcome. So part of the role of the product owner the chief product owner in the EMS, for the, the outcomes that they're responsible for at their level, they should be defining how I know that I've reached that outcome and they create metrics off of those. And so when I meet in my meta scrum, we should actually look at what the outcome is that we're responsible for and then look at the metrics, the actual data that we actually receive in relation to it to see if we're on track. And then that way you can continuously get the buy-in and stay on track. This uh, next question, do, do you happen to have experience to combine with the key value indicator approach um, from, from Peter Cohn? And I personally, I'm not super familiar with the key value indicator approach. Um, I'm gonna assume that it's pretty much what we're talking about here. And maybe we can, uh, we can meet offline to get more in depth with it. And the last question here, but what if these numbers are confidential, like budget and actual ROI? Management may not want a program to know such uh, numbers because uh, it, it can cause various impacts. Well, 
that's an excellent question. First of all, um, again, I'm going back to the, the three pillars of Agile in Scrum. Uh, the three pillars of Scrum, because again, we're talking about Scrum at scale here, is transparency, inspection, and adaption. And so you, you want to make things transparent. So a lot of companies actually keep things confidential that they don't need to keep confidential, right? Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I, I want to actually point out, if there's, um, you know, there are some, you know, especially in, in high tech industries and financial industries, there's some information that we do want to have uh, confidential. So that way if someone actually leaves, they can't take this stuff to a competitor. Um, understanding that most often, and notice when we actually list out outcomes on this slide, most often there's more than one outcome at every level. Only one of those outcomes usually relates to money. And again, you should have at least one outcome related to money, but most often there are other outcomes that are desired. So if you actually want to keep one of those outcomes, like the budget confidential, that's okay. I should just make sure that the other outcomes that we're actually delivering are front and center in everyone's mind and communicated and tracked, right? Those are the things that we should be making visible. The problem that we have in our industry right now is that we often don't take the time to define all the outcomes we want. Now, whoever created this thing at the top, the strategy, they have it in mind, but because they haven't written it down and communicating it, no, no one else knows, right? So we just want to make sure that all that becomes visible. So that way, when you have to make some design decisions about what you're doing, both with your product and with your process, you have the information to do that. All right, so we've, we've gone through, oops, I'm sorry. We've gone through, I just want to make sure we, uh, we get where we're at here. We've gone through <laughs> and we've actually discussed the uh, outcome versus output. And we're actually ready to kind of jump into the next piece, which is our method of assessing the time boxes. And in order to transition into that topic, um, what I want to highlight is that the whole hierarchy that we create in our, in our company should be based upon outcomes and it should be transparent. And personally, my experience has been, you really can't do a good job of managing this unless you have some sort of tool that allows you to have all these levels. So keep in mind, what we, we talked about earlier, I'm gonna go back to this previous slide, but I have an outcome there's a, some, I, I develop an approach to actually reach the outcome, right? Here's how I'm going to do it. That approach is based on assumption, right? And I have a hypothesis. And the hypothesis that I'm actually testing out should involve the relationship between the assumptions that underlie my approach, the output that we're going to produce, and the outcome that we want to actually deliver, right? And if that's the case, if I go back here, if you notice what we have in our hierarchy, what we do is we ask, well, here's the outcome that I want to produce. Here's the underlying assumption, and I want these tied together. And here's the hypothesis that I have, right? And I have that tied to the, a lower level uh, outcome. And I have that lower level outcome tied to the assumptions that underlie that and tied to the hypothesis for that. And the reason I want all these tied together in the hierarchy is so that if I find out by testing out my hypothesis, by doing some of the work that I do um, in, in each uh, iteration, in each sprint, if I find out that my assumptions, one of them are, are, is not true, if it is the basis for my approach, then if it's not true, I need to change my approach. So I, I need to know what is it connected to? What are the outputs that I was trying to produce that was based on this assumption that was wrong? Because if I can find that out, then what happens is I can go ahead and remove 
those outputs from scope. And now I'm being more effective because I'm getting rid of things that I don't need to build. Right? And that's the objective here. The effectiveness is all based upon doing the things that you need to, but only those things. The things that are super fluid, I need to get out of scope. And so when we talk about the time box pieces, again, what you see in this chart is here are the traditional different work types. And like we call them value containers, right? And here's the timeline up here at the top in which we expect to produce these things. And that's not really what we focus on. And what we're saying is that for each one of these different items, you should have a corresponding outcome that you're trying to produce in that timeline, right? And if you're doing this, then what tends to happen is that you're going to have the time and tested milestones. And each of those milestones is going to have a goal. And that goal is going to relate to an outcome. Right? And I may not produce the whole thing, but I may produce a piece of it. But you should actually define, here's the piece that I'm producing as far as the outcome. Here's my target number that I should have by this date. Right? And Here's the evaluation criteria. Here's how I'm going to know whether or not I've reached it, right? And I should have already predetermined, I'm going to make this decision on this date, at this checkpoint, at this milestone. And if it reaches this number, I should have already predetermined thresholds and predetermined what the analysis is. So I've reached this threshold, this target number. It means X, so I'm going to make this decision. And I should do this continuously throughout the entire project, throughout the entire work, throughout all my operations. And if I'm doing this continuously, then basically, you know, there's always this debate on how do you find leading indicators. The leading indicators should be based on how much of the outcome you're producing on those metrics. And they should actually inform my decision, and they'll let me know if I'm taking the right approach. It takes, it takes work to do that, right? And one of my favorite things in the world is this next portion, which is when do we do this? The cadence for the assessment. So I'm going to turn this back over to Rhonda to discuss this portion. Rhonda, I think you're still on mute. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so you need to have some some cadence of looking at this on a regular basis. And so, what if you're responsible for an output and making this type of assessment? What are you looking at? And so, here's a chart where um, where I've kind of combined it together in almost a report format and a, a cadence format is. You have a set of outputs that are being created, and I've represented those by the Gantt chart lines, um, where different things, different outputs are being created over time. Here's, here's the timeline for those. And then up at the top, you are seeing milestones, where your milestones, they correlate to those outputs, but the milestones are, are out, outcome milestones. So you're expecting your outcomes to be produced and things that you should see some change in your outcomes at those different milestones. And so you need to check that you're getting those outcomes that you're expecting based on the milestones you've defined. Then we also have these checkpoints and the checkpoints are really special milestones where, or sorry, the decision checkpoints. The decision checkpoints are those special milestones where upfront before this this has even the work has even started that the the work on the outputs has started you've come up with some decision points where you say if this happens i'm going to make this decision and maybe this change and you're defining those up front so from the time of approval those decision checkpoints and what those changes and decisions are have been defined and why do you define them up front, if at all possible? It's because you don't want them to be based on emotion. You don't want them to be, you don't want to use the wrong criteria for making that decision. You want to think these out logically up front so that when you get to that point 
and things may not be going the way you anticipated. You're not making decision based on um, pressure, uh, timeline pressure, um, emotions that come into play. You want this clearly thought out. So we have these decision checkpoints. I find that in terms of a cadence, I like to put a decision checkpoint on a quarterly boundary. And that might not work for you, but the reason I do that with, with the, the previous organization I was working on or the current organization I've been working with is we want quarterly boundary checkpoints to ensure that the information is evaluated, that the decisions made and the change happens. And so I actually put together a, a cadence for them that every quarter they'll ensure that it happens at least quarterly. Now this might not be frequent enough for you. You should be looking at things like how fast are you executing? The faster you're executing, the more decision checkpoints you want to have um, because, because things are changing rapidly. You're learning faster. You're getting that feedback loop faster. If things are high risk, you probably want to check more often. Or if things are, are critical, mission critical items, you're going to want to check more frequently. Um, but with the organization, I, I helped establish their management committee and basically gave them quarterly checkpoints for that EMS, for that management committee to come in, take a look at that data and make decisions at least on a quarterly basis. Now, do you have to wait for the quarter to happen to make that decision? No, if you've got that, if you've got the data ahead of time, you know you need to make a change, make that decision, make that pivot, go ahead and do it by all means, but at least that decision checkpoint ensures that you don't forget that it happens. And why is that so critical? Because this, this whole thing, the alignment of it has to be managed. So if you have something at the strategic level where you're making a pivot because you've proved some, your assumptions were false and therefore you have to come up with a new set of outputs to support that outcome because you've changed your hypothesis, you've changed your approach, then everything linked to that in the whole hierarchical structure will also need to pivot. And you need to manage that to make sure it happens. Because if it doesn't happen, then you're, you're at risk for not achieving your outcomes because everything didn't pivot. And whatever didn't pivot is waste. You're doing things you shouldn't be doing and, and you need to eliminate that waste. Brian, you want to take it from here? Yeah. Um, our, our last item here is the link from outcome realization to strategy realization. And Rhonda actually set things up really nicely with that last piece where she's discussing, hey, we have this cadence. You can actually change things earlier, but we're going to force a change at a certain point. Right? You're going to force you to look at things and force you to review. And one thing you want to do is look at, when we we talk about realization. You want to look at where were the real values, what benefits that you really receive at those checkpoints, and then we use that information again, going back to our decision making system to say, all right, if I met this criteria within this threshold, then we're going to make this change. We'll do this thing. So again, it's informing that decision, and it should be a leap. The trouble is that. Oftentimes, we don't decide these things in advance, and so we become subject to bias. Additionally, if you have incentive systems that are based on output, then no matter what decision you should make, people will actually stay with the output. And so you have to make sure that these things are tied to outcome. Now, I'm looking at my, uh, my, my clock here, and I, I recognize that we're about at the end of time. <laughs> and so. Uh, I want to make sure that I address these last couple uh, uh, questions that we had in here. One of the questions was, um, uh, do sorry, you say sorry, that, Brian, to interrupt you, but maybe while you're doing that, maybe Alyssa could put up our final question for participants. And, and just to let you know, Brian and I can hang around longer for anybody who wants to hang on the line and, um, and talk through some questions. Wow, thank you very much, Rhonda. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, one of the questions that we had here was, 
I'm going to answer this thing with a full question. All right. One of the questions we had was, uh, do you say that teams are delivering output? And yes. Remember that all production comes from the team. The teams are actually the ones that are delivering the output. And we want to, what we want to do is make sure that as they deliver the output, part of your, as you, you do your breakdown for outcomes, we should make sure that those outcomes are broken down to a point where they go from executive level to the intermediate level to kind of the scale um, sprint goal that happens. Um, down to the sprinkle, right? So a lot of organizations, when they're doing Scrum, they avoid looking at the sprint goal, but it's really important. It should be outcome focused. So you, the teams are producing output, but your sprint goal should be outcome focused. Um, and then this last question we had was, have you seen this strategy work for operations teams whose primary focus is to support the environment? Their outcome is highly likely to change frequently. And the answer to this is absolutely yes. In fact, we've seen this strategy work um, on an increasing basis for operations teams. In fact, I'll go further to make sure you really understand. When we talk about portfolio management, portfolio management is value stream management, right? So value stream management is about looking at the value that's actually being produced and managing that throughout uh, the life cycle. And portfolio management, if you're actually translating the objective um, into things that are actually linked to execution, we're all focused on value. It's the same thing. And so when you're doing this value stream management piece, you, you should know that there are gonna be metrics for ongoing operations, how do we know things are actually working well, and then things that we're actually changing our organization to improve. But again, the technique works for both. All right, I think that uh, hopefully we've, uh, we've shown you as we went through the definition of portfolio management, how it actually uh, relates to outcome, right, which again is you need to make sure that you are doing your your breakdown based on outcome so that everyone knows and you're managing based on those. All the outputs, all the assumptions, you're tracking those in relation to how they affect the outcome. And you're breaking that down throughout your whole organization. If you focus on those, I can guarantee you're gonna have more successful agile implementation. In fact, by using these methods, um, we've been able to actually work with different companies and we've been able to actually, um, within a, a span of a, a few months, by focusing on effectiveness first, we've been able to actually get productivity gains of up to 50%. You know, but it's really hard, hard to do in the normal circumstances unless you're focusing on the right thing. Uh, so at this point, um, we know we're, we're at time, so we're going to, Thank you all for attending. We want to open it up to any questions because we're and we're available to hang on the line for a little bit for additional questions. So I don't know if uh, if Alyssa, you want to to open it up for for uh, those who want to ask questions. But for everyone else, we we thank you for showing up. If you have to leave early, and uh, hopefully we'll meet again next time. So any, any other questions people have? I see some hands raised. All right, I see that um, Pradeep has a, a hand raised. And I also see that there's a question here on um, oh, how does the leadership team time box um, their high level strategies? And so, kind of what you want to have, and Wander, feel free to jump in. <laughs> But what you want to have is this being planned in advance. So when I actually develop my, my vision, I'm going to develop some strategic goals, and those are usually three to five years out. I should define the outcomes. What do I expect to see in three to five years? How do I judge 
whether or not we've actually made it. And then I should break that down and say, all right, leadership team, what are the strategic objectives we want in three to five years? I mean, from, from three years. And then for this year, we break that down to initiatives. So what are the initiative outcomes you expect to see within this year? So the leadership team should actually make sure that the outcomes are actually broken down as you go through. And then that should transfer to the chief product owner. And they should look at the initiative outcome and say, all right, so for each feature that we actually implement, what do we expect to see as far as benefits from that? And they should track those benefits. And then if you're applying this methodology, because typically the industry has been focused on um, trying to prioritize by ROI, but if you're prioritizing by outcome, it's gonna be a little bit different. I'm saying, hey, you know what? If I wanna achieve this outcome, what do we need to produce for it? What assumptions do we need to validate up front? Because again, if your business case is wrong, then everything associated is wrong. But that's a way more value than just trying to hurry up and build things. So we had another question here, which was, uh, how how do these concepts um, are merged with agile portfolio management? Here's the deal. These concepts are agile portfolio management. So in the past, the traditional approach, and, and feel free to jump in here right there. The traditional approach has been to focus on the output and just measure those in a project management type um, kind of situation. And what we're saying is that looking at here's the outcome I want to find that, here, is, here are the assumptions that underlie it, tracking that, proving those things out sprint by sprint, um, and then forming hypotheses and proving or disproving it. What we're saying is that those are the skill sets of agile portfolio management, and that's the main focus. You want to add anything to that, Rhonda? Yeah, I think um, you're right. And, and, and looking at that whole value stream, basically that whole structure is agile portfolio management. And, and I think, you know, things went off the rails somewhere along the, the line where I think, you know, I think if you look at old traditional companies, you know, turn back time, you know, maybe environments weren't changing so much. If you're in a stable environment, a stable economy, things are predictable. Um, people didn't, people didn't need to have, um, kind of more of a, a learning and strategic approach. They just said, here's a set of stuff we're going to do. Here's the checklist and we're going to go execute. But what we're finding is that doesn't work. Um, we live in a world where, um, there's a lot of unknowns. Things are very complicated. Um, environments change. We don't have all the information. And you have to, um, the, the checkbox approach of deliverables just doesn't work anymore. And so you have to manage the whole value stream in portfolio management to really get those outcomes. It's the whole entire thing. And if you don't have a way to see the whole value stream, to see the whole series of connections, um, when anything changes, you need a way to be able to manage that. Um, you know, and some tools are probably a good idea looking at some tools like something from digital AI that gives you a suite of tools that can connect all those stuff together for you. Yeah, because if, if you can't identify it, you're not going to know what, when to intervene or when, when, when to fix things. And that's one of the major concerns of your, upper, your leadership team, your upper management team. When do I intervene? When and where? All right, there was one more question that we didn't answer. Um, so we'll throw this one to you, Rhonda, because <laughs> this one's tough. Which one is it? Uh, okay. Um, when you don't produce widgets, so you're a service organization, measuring is more difficult. What are your strategies for measuring outcomes in that scenario? So a service organization where you're doing, um, you don't have a product, but your, your product is your service, right? 
And so, you know, I'm not quite sure what kind of service organization you, you're in, but if I think of what are some outcomes of maybe a service type organization, the outcomes might be maybe the vision is to be the, the, the most well-known, the best service organization in the world. That's your vision. You want to get there. So what would you see as your outcomes if you were number one service organization in that area in the world? You might see, um, you know, customers giving you great reviews, great customer satisfaction. It might be your outcomes might be um, uh, your your reputation. Um, you've got the market space for that. Um, I'm just rattling stuff off. And so I think this all still applies. So what would you do? What would your what would be your strategy to achieve those outcomes? Um, you know, and it might be things that are more geared towards instead of product development, maybe it's around um, customer satisfaction. It might be around notoriety. It might be around marketing and reputation. So those actions or those outputs that you're doing might be in terms, you know, might not be the widget, but it might be information. It might be, you know, it, it might be geared towards other types of, of things going on in the organization, not a product development um, into it. All right, so I think that yeah, was the. <laughs> any other, yeah, you're right. Any other questions that anyone has while we're still on? So what we'll do is uh, we have. Hopefully, everyone can see the slide now that, uh, with our information on it. Um, a couple of you. Put in the chat your uh, contact information to, to get further information. So I'm actually in the process of writing those down now to make sure that I can contact you and uh, answer the rest of your questions. Um, again, we want to thank you all for attending the session. If you uh, any other questions you have, just feel free to throw them out or contact us. Um, we have a, a a YouTube channel that has videos with some more information, um, and then. Also, if you go on the Scrum at Scale site, you're going to see Agile Portfolio Management classes pop up. Um, oh, looks like that. As I was saying that, we actually got a couple more questions. You ready, Rhonda? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Um, so this one says, but love to see what is a great organizational structure for setting up this type of strategy for a startup. Um, my experience I had with 150 projects required to do um, portfolio management. Have you experienced this and how do you be more effective for them? Yeah, so so I can start with this, Brian. I, I think one thing is you do want to tailor your outcome-based breakdown structure depending on your organization. So you might find your organization is small and that we have a slide in there of the work breakdown structure that we've been using with with clients that we have right now but if that sorry the outcome based breakdown structure not the work breakdown structure we don't use those but the outcome based breakdown structure that might be too complicated for a small startup and so i think our structure has five layers in it if i'm remembering correctly you if you're mm -hmm. a startup maybe you need two or three layers um, and that's absolutely fine because you need to tailor it based on your size, based on complexity of things, and based on how many levels um, each role can be responsible for. So if you're finding that each level in your organization can be responsible for, or each role in your organization can be responsible for two levels, maybe you have three roles and you're going to have six levels, or maybe you find that that's too much because you're small. So tailoring your your breakdown structure, how many levels it has, absolutely fine. And and again, the rule of thumb that I keep is make sure that you're only defining one or two outcome levels per role in in your organization. And it should align to your Scrum at scale organization also. So as your Scrum at scale levels increase, as your organization grows from a startup to a bigger company. You're scaling your Scrum at scale um, from your Scrum to your Meta Scrum to your, uh, you know, to your Eat and also your, um, you know, the the product cycle. 
you, you know, how many product owners, chief product owners, chief, chief product owners, and then eventually your EMS, as that grows, those two should be very tied together in terms of the layers in your Scrum at Scale organization and tied to the layers in your output structure. Yeah, I think that was an excellent job uh, answering that. There, there were two questions that came in that were related. One was how to address this with a small company. And again, your answer before, as far as the smaller you are, you just want to eliminate some layers. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a, the opposite question of, you know, what if you're a large organization? And it, again, it's the opposite. Um, the bigger you are, and this is how you, you actually institute the scaling with Scrum at Scale, is that you just you add more layers um, the bigger you are. And you always want to keep that ratio where you only have one to two layers um, levels per um, hierarchy in your organization. But uh, yeah, you, you just keep doing that piece of it. So there's a, an, another big one that came across twice. <laughs> so this must be a really big question. Um, how do you define good outcomes? So in, in, in this question, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and Ronnie, you can just kind of jump in as, as you, you feel the need. Um, so we first, you should know that we have a whole, you know, part of the Agile portfolio management class actually spends a great deal of time in actually walking you through exercises to get good at this skill, because it, it is a skill. Um, now, in brief, what you're actually doing is you are asking basically starting off by asking to describe the outcome. What outcome do you want? So for whatever you're doing, you know, you picture what does success look like? And as you're asking this question, you're going to actually you ask yourself, what are the essential characteristics that must exist for you to say that you had a good outcome? And how do I see these things? And as you start answering these types of questions, you'll end up describing what the outcomes actually look like. And you'll do it in a way that you can actually make it measurable. So that's, that's basically what you want to do um, in defining it out. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's good, Brian. I think it's a skill that you have to practice because everybody's tendency is when you're defining outcomes, everybody and even myself even though i've done this for years i also always have to double check myself is what it, what i just said or what i just wrote as an outcome is that really an outcome or is it an output double check yourself because it's easier to come up with outputs than outcomes so everybody has a tendency to go back into that output uh definition and so there's a set of questions that I like to ask. Um, and again, we can go, we go into this in one of our classes, but some key questions I really like, and it's basically asking the same question, but asking it in multiple ways is, what does success look like? What would you see if you achieved that outcome? To me, that's the best question that really gets people thinking in the right frame of mind. But then you're gonna wanna put metrics around your outcome. You're going to want to put what is the measure and what's the metric and what are you going to expect? And some of these metrics might be leading indicators and some lagging indicators, but you, you, um, you want to be able to put metrics around it. All right, so I'm adding it. Another question come in. I think that the uh, we, the answer how to, how to define good outcome, but I think the inflection may have been wrong as I read it. <laughs> so I had another thing come in on the chat. Um, how and I think it's actually asking how do you define good outcome? <laughs> um, and so I, that inflection, I, I think that the the difference you're actually asking about is. Um, how do you make sure that the, the outcomes that you're defining are actually good? Um, and I, I think that, again, this is in how, just piggybacking on, on what 
Rhonda just talked about, we asked the question of, like, what do you actually see to let you know that it's good? Um, you really have to keep asking yourself that question. And is there anything else I see? Is there anything else I see? Um, and it's important to, to get buy-in from those that you're involved with um, so they actually agree that whatever the answers are to those questions, that they see it the same way. So you got to get on the same page. Then. If you don't get on the same page with it, then you don't have buy-in, and you probably don't won't have confirmation that these are good outcomes that you actually want. Um, so again, it, it's your peer group that actually help you to indicate whether they're good or not. Um, they should be able to relate to it um, and agree to it. And also, they should be able to understand to a point that they should be able to break it down to a lower level. Um, uh, all right, uh, another question. Any links or content to refer back on Agile portfolio management and case studies? Um, we, actually, we actually have both um, links and case studies. And so, one, you're going to receive, I think Scrum at Scale will actually make this slide deck available to you, so you'll be able to grab this. And I'm just going to make a note, because um, I think that you actually put your contact information in the chat. I'm going to double check it now to make sure I have it. Uh, yes, this is you. All right, so what I'll do is um, I have your email, so I'll email you some uh, some additional information that that we had because we we actually developed uh, case studies for a couple of our the clients that we work with, um, and we also have some additional uh, information on the All right, guess what, Rhonda? I think we're good. Thank I you, everybody, for attending me. <laughs> Thank you all. Yes. And please feel free to reach out to us if we can help. I will pop back in real quick just to do some closing remarks. Thank you so much, Brian and Rhonda, for hosting today's webinar. There was a ton of questions and uh, quite a few mm. people staying about 25 minutes after, which is always a really good sign. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, I was wondering, can we, can you copy the whole chat for us? Because there's a lot of people putting their contact information in there. Yes, definitely. I have the chat um, archive so we can get in contact with people after. Um, and then also, I just wanted to reiterate, I've seen a couple of questions. The um, post webinar email will receive, will include a link to today's uh, recording, as well as a link to your guys' YouTube channel. And we'll also stick the slides on there so that you can download the PDF and reference those later. Um, and I will also include um, both of your guys' contact information so that if anyone has any last minute questions or wants to reach out to you, um, they can do so. With that. All right. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much and thank you to everyone uh, that joined. Um, of course, if you want to learn more about Scrum at Scale, the framework, or take a Scrum at Scale practitioner class, uh, Brian mentioned it earlier, but all of those are available on our website. And uh, that's about it. Thanks everyone for joining. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.